When it comes to computer audio, you've probably come across these numbers every so often. Let's start with the first two, bit depth and sample rate. If we picture a sound wave similar to an image, we can divide it into rows and columns like we would with an image made out of pixels. Digital audio has to be divided into a finite number of rows and columns because that's the definition of digital. Bit depth, which has nothing to do with the bitrate by the way, refers to the number of rows, while sample rate is the number of columns in one second. Don't forget that the horizontal axis in sound is time. You can think of bit depth like this. The higher the bit depth, the higher the resolution of the sound. 16 bits are equal to around 65,000 in decimal, while 24 bits are equal to over 16 million. So a 24-bit sound file will have way more rows and therefore much higher resolution than a 16-bit sound file. This should make you think that 24-bit sound has much higher quality, but in reality 16-bit is perfectly fine for us to listen to, and due to limitations with our sense of hearing, 24-bit audio does not really sound any better to us than 16-bit. However, 24-bit and even 32-bit is useful when mixing different sounds together in music production. Regarding sample rate, your first thought may be that similar to bit depth, the higher it is, the higher the resolution of the sound. It's not really that simple though. Again, remember that the horizontal axis is just time. You've probably heard that us humans can hear sound frequencies in the range between 20 and 20,000 Hz. Hertz means waves per second by the way, so 20,000 Hz is equal to 20,000 waves in one second. So, if you think about it, the number of columns we need is just double of 20,000, so that we can draw a simple 20,000 Hz wave like this. Any more columns than that would be useless, as any sound with higher frequencies will be inaudible to us anyway. This is where those common sample rate numbers just above 40,000 come from. Since not everyone has the same exact maximum audible frequency, but we know that it's around 20,000 for most people, the smart computer people had chosen the standard sample rate for CD audio to be 44,100 Hz. I don't know why they decided to make it 44,100 and not a nice 44,000, but they did. Anyway, then when the DVD standard came out, they decided to up it to 48,000 for no particular reason except to make things more complicated, I guess. At least 48,000 is a pretty nice round number though. Professional studios may use sample rates of 96,000 or even 192,000, which can be useful for complicated reasons I won't go into, but you probably wouldn't hear any difference between them at all. Lowering the bit depth to below 16 bits reduces the audio quality, similar to lowering the resolution of an image. In fact, retro games used to use 8-bit audio, the quality of which was much more limited. Lowering the sample rate, however, doesn't do the same thing exactly. For example, if you have the sample rate to 22,000 Hz, all sound frequencies above 11,000 Hz would be cut off but any frequency below that would barely be affected, so lowering the sample rate will remove higher frequencies, but keep lower frequencies intact. Having a low sample rate can still be useful if you want highly compressed audio files. For example, if you're gonna work solely with voice, you don't need high frequencies, as human speech rarely goes above 3000 Hz, so you can afford to use a lower sample rate to save bandwidth. This is why telephone audio usually sounds a bit weird like this. The other number that I haven't yet talked about is bitrate. It just refers to the amount of compression done to an audio file to save storage space. The lower the number, the stronger the compression, and the lower the audio quality will be in return. A compressed mp3 file with a bitrate of 192 kilobits per second will take up 192 kilobits or 24 kilobytes for each second of audio, so if it's a 3 minute song it will take up just over 4 megabytes of space. An uncompressed WAV file will take up much more space, we can calculate exactly how much pretty easily. If it's a 16 bit file with a 48000 Hz sample rate, 
Then we just need to multiply the two numbers together and we'll get 768 kilobits per second. However, virtually all songs are stereo, which means that they have two separate tracks for the left and the right channels. So we we'll need to double that number and we'll get 1536 kilobits per second. So the same 3 minute song uncompressed would take around 34 megabytes of storage space. I won't get into how the compression is achieved as it's a very complex procedure using algorithms that look for regular patterns and stuff. MP3 is a lossy compression algorithm, which means that some data is lost with the compression. However, there are also some lossless algorithms like FLAC, which can reduce the file size a bit while making sure that no audio data is lost. This is similar to how PNG image files work while JPG on the other hand is a lossy algorithm. With MP3, 192 kilobits per second is usually considered to be a very good compromise. Most people will not be able to tell the difference between that and the original lossless audio. 320 kilobits per second is a step higher than that, where even experienced musicians using professional equipment will find it difficult to distinguish between that and uncompressed audio. All we've been talking about in this video so far has to do with digital audio. It's good to know the difference between digital and analog if you don't already. Basically, digital data is data that is quantized, which means that it's divisible into finite pieces. In the case of computers, these finite pieces are binary zeros and ones. Analog, on the other hand, is not quantized and can be divided infinitely. In the case of sound, analog audio would literally be the sound wave itself. You can think of sound traveling through the air as analog data. This wave can be converted into an analog electrical wave, which is what a microphone does, and this can then be converted to actual sound through a speaker. At first glance, it may seem that analog is better than digital, as it is more accurate to the original signal, well, it is the original signal in a way, but analog data loses quality with distance, like how a sound becomes quieter the further away it is, and it can't be manipulated very easily. A digital audio file on the other hand can be mass copied, sent to anyone anywhere in the world, edited or combined with other sounds, and all this without losing any information in the process at all. This is why computers made sharing and producing music much easier and cheaper than ever before. As much as digital audio is very useful, it still needs to be converted to analog at some point if we ever want to hear it, because our brains can't interpret random zeros and ones, yet, but they can in fact interpret actual sound waves. So every digital device that has a speaker will have a digital to analog converter, or DAC, somewhere within it. And devices that include microphones will also have the opposite counterpart to that, an analog to digital converter, or ADC. The headphone jack port transmits an analog sound signal that would have already been processed by the device's DAC. This is why it's sometimes referred to as an analog jack. Any headphones or speakers that connect directly with a jack don't need to have their own DAC, therefore. All they need is a speaker cone and they're ready to go. On the other hand, devices that connect via USB or wirelessly through Bluetooth need to have their own DAC, as USB and Bluetooth can only transmit digital data that hasn't been converted to analog yet. Once an audio signal has been converted to analog, the electrical signal will take the form of the literal sound wave itself. This can be easily converted to sound by attaching a magnet to a speaker cone and connecting that to the wire. The magnet will move back and forth in accordance to the electrical signal that is passing through, which will cause the cone to also move back and forth in the same way and this will reproduce the wave into actual sound waves in the air. It's good to remember that sound waves are longitudinal waves, not transverse waves, which means that the wave isn't really traveling as shown here. Basically, whenever the drawn line is at the top, the speaker cone would be stretched to its max towards one end. When the line is right in the middle, the cone would be in its neutral position, and when the line is at the bottom, the speaker would be stretched towards the opposite end. 
So in reality, the electrical signal and the speaker cone would be moving something like this. Microphones work the exact same way, except totally opposite, so maybe the exact same way was the wrong thing to say, come to think of it. The mic's diaphragm vibrates when sound waves hit it, and this causes a magnet to vibrate along a wire, which produces an electrical signal in the wire. The signal will then arrive at an ADC, where it will be converted to digital audio. In fact, a speaker can theoretically work as a microphone, and vice versa, but it wouldn't work very well at all, as speaker cones typically have different designs than microphone cones. Okay, I think that's all I had to say about this subject for real now. I hope you actually found these videos interesting, and as always, thanks for watching.